Hello, all you wonderful, lovely people. How's it going? Welcome to D&D Optimized, the show where each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, as in the case this week, uh, character builds for Dungeons & Dragons 5e. We theorycraft about them, we crunch numbers, and we do our best to make them as powerful as possible for the role that we've chosen those for those characters to play um, in-game. Welcome. Um, if you enjoy character creation in Dungeons & Dragons almost as much as playing the actual game itself, then uh, welcome home. This is where you belong, and we are super happy to have you. My name's Colby, and I'm your host, and uh, yeah, thanks for being here. You know, if you guys like uh, the video and the content, I hope you will consider liking and subscribing if you're not subscribed, and even joining um, to support the channel. It really helps us out uh, to, you know, be able to bring more content and improve the quality as we go. So anyway, thanks for your consideration. Today, we are going to do um, another one of my team up builds where we're taking two characters and kind of trying to optimize them together in a way that uh, finds a lot of synergy between them and makes them super fun and powerful and, and things like that in game. Specifically, um, as you've probably been able to tell if you read the title to the video, uh, we're talking today about the Necromancer and the Oathbreaker Paladin uh, combined, right? So you're playing with a friend, hopefully, uh, one of these characters and and your buddies playing the other so um, You know before we jump into the builds as always I have uh, some things to talk about so I have had um, a lot of requests for a necromancer the very first poll that I ever did asking you guys what you wanted to see me do a build on next had a sort of necromancer or other summoner type um, in there and it won by a landslide and then instead of doing necromancer I did the Pokemon trainer uh, whoop, uh, episode um, that, that was fun and I think fairly well received, but I've been putting off Necromancer ever since and I still get requests for it, so we're going to do it today, but I wanted to couple it with um, the Oathbreaker Paladin because I think there's so many great and fun synergies between the two, both from a roleplay thematic perspective, but also uh, from a numbers perspective. So the reality is this. These are going to be a couple of my, I would say, less complicated builds. Um, we're not going to be doing a lot of multi-classing. We're not going to be taking a lot of feats. Um, you know, there, there's just not a lot that's super complicated about it. What I really want to explore is both the numbers potential, as always, um, but also discuss the challenges and problems that you run into whenever you have a character uh, or characters like this that focus a lot on summoning lots of monsters and minions to sort of do their fighting for them. And I think nobody kind of gets at the problems, the potential problems and challenges uh, that are inherent in that sort of play style than the Necromancer in particular. The, the preamble and the conversation here is gonna be a little bit long. I think the actual build itself will be a little bit more straightforward and not super complicated and, and hopefully a little shorter, although there will be two characters, so that could make up for it, but anyway. Um, let's jump into sort of the important discussion that we need to have about the challenges that playing a necromancer, in particular one who's abusing the animate dead spell, presents um, at your table. So here's my hypothesis. Necromancers, as they exist in 5e, um, particularly when they abuse the uh, animate dead spell, are broken. And, and by broken, I don't mean they're so overpowered that they absolutely have to be nerfed. It's more like they're either so overpowered that they have to be nerfed or they're largely worthless and, 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 and trivialized, right? So there doesn't seem to be, to me, a lot of in-between to those two extremes with this particular class and spell. Um, you could, as a necromancer, using and abusing animate dead, using all of your highest level spell slots to summon skeletons and zombies, um, you could potentially, uh, you know, summon dozens and dozens by mid and late game uh, of undead thralls using this single spell. It doesn't require concentration. You can buff them pretty nicely, which we're going to do, especially with the help of your Oathbreaker um, Paladin ally, um, which, you know, like I say, we will do. Um, 
And if you could actually get all of these undead to fight for you, to take a turn in combat, making attacks, um, at mid and higher levels, they, they will be doing hundreds and hundreds of damage per round um, sustainably. And so much damage that it would be almost impossible for any reasonable DM to not just simply destroy them in mass with, you know, level five cleric or above with a single channel divinity, you know, destroy undead, um, or, you know, a, a spellcaster throwing out some powerful area of effect damage spells. And so, you know, again, if you're, if you're kind of wanting to play this necromancer with an undead army, like you're either way too strong or worthless. <laughs> and, and there's not a lot of middle ground. Here. The obvious solution, I suppose, is, well, don't abuse the spell. That, that's tough for me and I think other people who, who like to crunch numbers and stretch the limits of you know, what's possible to sort of be given this toy, but be told, well, like you can't use it to its full potential uh, as we've written it into the game. Um, you know, we're, we're leaving a governor on uh, this, this tool that, that we've given you. Um, you could do it. It would have to be some sort of artificial constraints that you'd talk o talk over with your DM, I think, um, to sort of try and find a balance for it. And we will discuss some of those solutions in the final thoughts, so stay tuned. Um, I think I'm also actually going to bring this up in my sliding into my DMs um, episode this week, so stay tuned for that if this is interesting to you and you want to kind of see some further discussion on it. Let's take a look at all of these sort of potential problems and questions, uh, in addition to the balance issue, that you're going to run into and have to deal with when playing this necromancer oathbreaker combo um, and trying to really lean on you know the action economy of having lots and lots of uh, undead minions at your command. Um, first off, like I've said, they are highly susceptible to a single area of effect damage spell. Um, with the buffs that we're going to be giving them, most, I think, would be able to survive for at least a couple of big area of effect spells, maybe even three, depending on the level and how the dice are rolled and things. Um, but still, you know, pretty susceptible there. Um, susceptible to, you know, even more deadly here, a single cleric with, you know, a destroy undead capability that's going to wipe out all of these skeletons and zombies. They are, after all, only a one quarter level challenge rating. So like I've said, a level five cleric is going to be able to really trivialize, you know, all of these resources and things that you've dumped into, into um, creating this, this undead army, right? In addition to that, though, there are a lot of other logistic and potentially roleplay problems. Um, you know, other characters in your party might not be really comfortable playing with a character who sort of controls and summons, you know, undead minions to fight for them. Um, the Oathbreaker Paladin in particular, we are told to play an Oath Oathbreaker, you have to be an evil character. Um, we did a sliding into my DMs episode on uh, character alignment, and, and so you know, feel free to check that out and, and uh, explore the potential challenges and, and pitfalls that you might run into um, with you know playing with evil characters and things. But some DMs might not like that or even allow it. Some players might struggle with that, and maybe they want to play like a lawful good character or something. And you're gonna have to kind of figure out how to navigate that. Like in your party, I'm not saying that it can't be done. It's just something that you're going to need to think about and plan on and talk with you know your other players and, and your DM about. Not only that, a lot of the NPCs in your campaign are very likely going to have a problem with you, you know, traipsing around with lots and lots of skeletons and zombies and things following you, right? Anytime you try to go into a town or a city, the guards probably aren't going to be real comfortable with that. They, you know, you might end up getting in fights. You could potentially leave your undead thralls outside of the city. Once they get more than 60 feet away from you, you, um, you can't issue commands to them anymore. You could give them a general command that they would just continue to keep. Um, you know, you could say, hey, go hide in the woods over here and stay there until I come back or something like that. But it can be tricky, right? It can be tricky in, in that regard, thinking about, okay, how, you know, how am I going to deal with having these undead minions in, you know, a, a, a populated place? One of the biggest ones, uh, challenges, questions you're going to need to address for me is, you know, having a lot of minions in general 
really runs the risk of slowing down uh, your combat. Combat can already sometimes be a little slow and a little chuggy, right, um, in your game. And, and, you know, add to that somebody who has 10 or 15 or, heaven forbid, 70 skeletons <laughs> that are all going to take a turn making an attack, you know, every single round can just be frankly devastating to your campaign's morale and and just excitement and energy levels right it can get really slow and frankly boring for other people every time your turn comes up if it's going to take 10 15 20 minutes to resolve your turn right you know what can i do to sort of speed things up on my turn Maybe you're, you're using a digital die roller and you're saying, DM, give me the AC that I need to hit. And you just go to Google and type slash roll, you know, 10D20 or whatever, and just look at them and add your plus to hit modifier in your head and go, okay, um, hit, hit, miss, miss, hit, miss, hit, miss, miss, hit, right? Or whatever. And then roll all the damage at once or something like that. I mean, or, you know, pre-roll before it's your turn, start rolling and writing down, you know, what your numbers are. Um, maybe consider grouping your enemies in groups of three or five or something like that. Again, something to talk over with your DM and strategize here so that so that having lots of undead minions isn't just slowing combat down to a crawl and making it difficult for your entire party. Uh, what do you do with them when you're in tight spaces, in, inside a building, in a dungeon crawl where there's sort of narrow corridors and kind of smaller rooms? If you have more than three or four or five, six, it can get really challenging. There's not a lot of room to kind of maneuver to get, you know, things in range to be able to make attacks and stuff like that. And so, you know, if you if you get too many of them and if you're going to be playing in a lot of tight enclosed spaces, um, this may not be the character for this particular campaign, right? Um, they're going to do a lot better in big spaces, especially outdoor where, you know, everybody can kind of spread out and things. So, Again, something to think about. Um, another potential challenge or problem. What happens if you go unconscious? <laughs> You're, you lose control of your, of your minions, and that's something that your party's going to have to deal with. And that's actually, I like this. It's kind of cool. It's, it's a high-risk, high-reward kind of thing. Um, really might upset your party if all of a sudden in the middle of a challenging combat, now they also have to deal with 10 skeletons or something like that because you went down, right? Um, so something to think about. Where are you getting all of these corpses or piles of bones? Um, you know, if it's from your slain enemies, okay. But, uh, you know, especially once you get into the really high numbers that we're going to be getting into, you're going to have to be robbing graves, probably exhuming corpses. I don't know. How do you deal with creatures who are resistant to non-magical attacks? I mean, can you equip your can you equip your undead thralls with uh, better armor, with better weapons, with you know magic weapons, so they can overcome resistance to non-magical attacks? Um, also, do they do they rise up if you see a pile of bones lying there that doesn't have a short sword or a or a short bow, and you create a skeleton out of it? Does it have a short bow and a short sword? I mean. I guess I would say yes, rules as written. The spell seems to indicate such that skeletons have a short bow and a short sword, but I've seen DMs say, well, you know, you got to give them a weapon to attack with, right? These are things that you're going to want to talk about. Think about equipment, and, and can I upgrade their equipment, or are they just sort of stuck with, nope, you know, this is a skeleton, they have a short bow, they have a short sword, the end, and their armor class is 13, and it's never going to increase, you know, etc. You know, if you can equip them with upgraded gear, you're going to have to think about, well, how are you going to haul all of that gear if, if and when your undead minions die and you don't have any spell slots to reanimate more? You know, you're hauling around suddenly lots of, you know, plus one short swords or, you know, lots of plate mail armor or, you know, plate armor or chain mail armor or whatever. I guess get a bag of holding or maybe you're going to have to have a cart, maybe to stash extra corpses too while you're at it and drive around. I mean, these are, you know, some logistical things that you're gonna have to think about. A question that I have, if your skeleton dies, can you re-raise a new skeleton from the same pile of bone bones? Um, maybe, you know, unless it got turned to ash or something like that, I suppose. But at what point um, do you just have to sort of find a new corpse or find a new pile of bones to create a new skeleton? 
Um, that's something that I would discuss with my DM beforehand, especially if I'm relying so heavily on these for my damage, and it's, you know, so central to my character. Um, all of these things, and, and probably others that I'm not thinking about, are important questions that you're going to want to talk with your other party members, with your dungeon master, and make sure that you just have sort of your eyes wide open and everybody else's eyes wide open as to what you're trying to do, the potential challenges, your plan for dealing with those potential challenges, etc., etc., so that you can make the experience um, not a disappointing one for you, um, for everyone else at your party, for your DM, etc., etc. Despite all of these potential challenges, potential drawbacks, um, I personally am still very, very curious to see just how far we could go with this undead army if we pushed it to its extreme limit, buffing it as much as we can, um, summoning as many undead minions as we possibly can, even if, it, even if it might not work very well in game, exactly as I'm going to talk about with just these dozens and dozens of minions, I wanna see what the limits are. And then again, as always, you know, it will help us and you know where to scale back and maybe where to f try and find compromises with your DM and things like that. So let's explore the extremes. Episode 36, The Necromancer and the Oathbreaker. And again, stay tuned for you know the final thoughts at the end where we'll talk a little bit about some ideas for maybe finding a way to balance this, make compromises between you and your DM. And stay tuned for the slide into my DMs episode later this week while we, where we will continue that conversation. Let's jump in. At level one, um, we are not, by the way, going to be doing any multi-classing on either of these characters. I know some of you who ask me to do this once in a while can, can rejoice. The spells and abilities for both classes are super important. And, you know, this build is really all about getting the most out of our undead minions. Um, and so the best way for us to do that is to get as many levels as quickly as possible in these classes that we've chosen. Um, and really, you know, individual character strength and damage and things like that is, is much less important than uh, the buffs that we can bring to our horde of undead. At level one, for the wizard character, um, class, wizard, obviously, uh, I, I would I would think it would be important for you to figure out why your character is so fascinated with undeath. Um, are you evil, or are you simply curious? Um, both, something else. Um, you know, definitely spend some time thinking about that. As for uh, your race, I'm going to recommend a turtle. Um, this is the squishiest wizard I've ever created. Uh, outside of my the wizard that I did for my wizard druid uh, team up build, and primarily because I'm such a gish lover, right? Uh, so there's no feat other than you know the the usual warcaster or resilient constitution that really screams out to me here, um, and you know we're primarily going to be in the back line, but you know taking that turtle and having that 17 natural armor is just going to be really nice for our survivability. Plus, the idea of a turtle walking around with a big skull painted on its shell is just it's just too good to pass up. Bones, you know, hanging from its shell and around its neck and things like that. I love I love the image. For those who don't know, like I've said, turtles get a 17 natural armor, um, but you can't benefit from any other armor you try to equip, and you also, including mage armor. And you also can't benefit from like your dexterity bonus. That's really, that's fine. I mean, you know, a 17 is higher than we would have been able to have with mage armor and a high dex. And now we get to save on ability score points, put them elsewhere if we want, and, uh, you know, save a spell slot by not having to, to use mage armor. So, um, of course, we could multi class to try and pick up heavy armor proficiency, you know, things like that. But like I said, I really want to just beeline um, in these classes. So, uh, no multi-classing. Um, turtles also get shell defense, which is cool and fun and, and I don't know, I, I, I love the idea of it. As an action, you essentially go inside your shell and it gives you a plus four to your AC while you're in there as well as advantage on strength and concentration saves. So that would include your concentration checks, right? Um, meaning that you know, we might not need Warcaster or Resilient Con after all, if we're going to take advantage of this a lot, which we may not decide to do. Um, 
for role play purposes and just for story and things, I, I would love to actually just like put up a concentration spell. I've got my undead minions eventually. And then I just like hide up in my shell and just let everybody else do the work. Um, but when you, when you are in your shell like that, you are prone. So melee enemies would have advantage on attacks against you. So it might not be great for your defense after all, you know, something you'll have to think about. And of course you won't be able to take actions while you're in there, like cast cantrips and things to sort of help bump your damage. Um, but a fun option to have. Uh, an alternate um, race, I think, here for me would be um, a drow half-elf, half-elf drow. Uh, you, you know, you get another plus one ability score increase, which is nice, um, but then also you get a fairy fire uh, spell. You can use fairy fire once per long rest only, but um, wizards don't typically get access to fairy fire, and um, that, that will be a nice, especially early on, concentration spell that you can use that will really increase the damage of your undead horde and, of course, um, your allies. When they're attacking against a target that has fairy fire on them, they'll be able to do so with advantage. And um, So anyway, a good alternative. Uh, as far as your ability scores go, assuming point by as always, uh, I recommend a 14 intelligence and then use your plus 2 from your racial on that, so you're at 16. Uh, 15 constitution plus one from your racial there so 16 on both of those and then you know other than that assign the points wherever you think uh, best um, try and you know even them out I guess as much as you can to help with your saving throws maybe down the line and your skill checks and things as far as equipment standard stuff I'm not gonna really go into it much just you know pick whatever uh, looks useful and helpful um, we're not gonna be super dependent on our equipment as far as spells, also fairly standard stuff. Most of your spell slots, especially once you get to level 5 and beyond, are going to be used for your undead army, um, or probably for defending yourself. Uh, so, you know, be sure to pick up Firebolt and Toll the Dead uh, as cantrips. They'll, they'll be your sort of damage options. Um, make sure you pick up shield and absorb elements to help, uh, you know, on your defense. Shield, of course, has a reaction that's going to um, raise your armor class by five until the start of your turn, potentially causing attacks to miss you. Absorb elements, among other things, lets you have resistance to a lot of different damage types and also usable as a reaction. Um, so those are great for defensive purposes. That's the wizard. So at level one for the paladin obviously your class is a paladin uh and you know again i would think about this why i mean oath breakers were told are uh, are supposed to be evil did you start out as evil um are you going to be breaking your oath along the way uh what caused you to break that oath right uh, these are all i think important things obviously to think about when you're creating your character as far as race goes um i'd recommend variant human um, there is a feat that we really, really want, uh, eventually anyway, and we might as well get it now and save ourselves a, an ASI or feat later. Um, if your DM already gives you a free feat or if you're looking for an alternative to Variant Human, um, I might go Elf and not because I want Elven accuracy. Um, I, would, I would take a Drow, and again, this might work really well if, uh, if, if your wizard took the Half-Elf drow, drow, maybe you guys are related, but... Um, it, it feels on point thematically. In fact, I could even see a story here where you were a, you were a drow elf paladin of Lolth um, and you broke your oath and thereby became neutral, maybe, or good, uh, of course, assuming your, your DM would allow it. Um, that could be interesting. But also, since elves uh, don't need to sleep and they only need four hours to benefit from a long rest, um, it will be easier for you to spend time buffing your uh, undead minions once you have them and you pick up uh, this feat eventually that we're going to get and I'll assume that you'll get if you went variant human. Um, and that free feat is the inspired leader feat. So inspired leader is pretty fantastic uh, for us especially. Um, for those who aren't familiar with this feat, you spend 10 minutes inspiring up to six creatures, including yourself, um, with a rousing, you know, speech. Um, each creature gains temporary hit points equal to your level plus your charisma modifier. Um, they can't gain any more temporary hit points in this way until they take a short or a long rest. Um, eventually, you will have more, many, many more. <laughs> 
than five undead thralls. So you will actually need to take 10 minutes like inspiring them in small groups, I suppose. Um, assuming you've got the time, it will be time consuming eventually. And so, you know, it might not work practically, but anyway, um, at least through the first, you know, several levels and into the mid game, um, I think it's, you know, you can, you can assume that you'll be able to do this with all of your undead thralls. Um, and, and frankly, I love the idea of an evil paladin giving like an inspiring speech to a bunch of <laughs> skeletons and zombies. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> What what is a what is a what does a leader say to a skeleton in order to inspire them and get them pumped up? I would love to know what you would tell your horde of uh, undead in order to um, in order to inspire them to to fight uh, better in in the coming conflict. Take an extra you know ten twenty thirty minutes depending on how many you have uh, each short rest to make sure that your allies of course and then also your undead thralls. Get uh, get these extra hit points because it will it will you know go a long way in combat, especially for these undead who tend to be pretty squishy. Here is a question that you're going to want to make sure you're clear on with your DM. Uh, you know, can my undead minions or the necromancer's undead minions anyway benefit from a short or a long rest and thereby not only you know use hit dice to recover hit points and things like that and recover full after a long rest but also benefit multiple times a day potentially from this inspiring leader feat, inspired leader uh, feat. And I think the answer is yes. Um, the question was asked to Jeremy Crawford and he said that, yeah, you know, like any other creature, they should be able to benefit from short and long rests. Um, I know that my DM, Corey, doesn't love always looking to Jeremy Crawford for, for rulings and advice and things. I think he can be a useful guide, and so I appreciate that, that he made this comment here. It makes me feel better about assuming that you'll be able to do the same. Keep that in mind, because it does make them a lot more durable, a lot stronger, if they can benefit uh, from rests. Paladin ability scores. Again, assuming point by, I would recommend starting with a strength of 15, plus 1, a charisma of 15, plus one for your racials, right? And a constitution of 14. Um, paladins are notoriously mad, multiple ability score dependent. Um, and sure, you could take a Hexblade dip here to not have to rely on strength so much, so you could use charisma for both your attack and uh, your spells and things like that. But um, as I said at the beginning, I wanna get to mid-level as quickly as possible, so no detours, no detours. Equipment, standard stuff. Again, take a shield, take uh, your chainmail armor, get a D8 weapon. Um, you know, whether that's a mace or a battle axe or a longsword or whatever. Not a mace, sorry, a warhammer. Anyway, divine sense is something that all paladins get at, uh, at level one. And it just lets you detect the presence of celestials, undead, or fiends within 60 feet of you, <laughs> which for you will be everywhere. Imagine a radar like lighting up, blip, blip, and then it's just like, blip. Um, anyway, Lay on Hands is that uh, other quintessential pally ability. It lets you heal with your touch. Um, you have a pool of hit points uh, based on your paladin level times five that you can use to sort of heal yourself or others uh, from any damage that they've taken. You can't use it on undead or constructs, unfortunately, um, but you can use it to heal poison and disease as well, so that's nice. And that's level one. All right, at level two, um, for your wizard. At level two, wizards get their subclass, their uh, arcane tradition, and of course, we are going school of necromancy. Um, necromancers at level two get a, a feature called Grim Harvest. And we're told that with Grim Harvest, when you kill a creature with a spell of first level or higher, you gain hit points equal to twice the spell's level or three times the spell's level if it is from the school of necromancy. Um, it's a nice little self-heal. You know, you might want to consider uh, making sure that you have a Ray of Sickness in your arsenal at this point. Um, it's a necromancy spell. It does damage and it potentially poisons uh, the target, which is great, you know, causing them to have disadvantage on their attacks and things um, and on their saves. Uh, if you're pretty sure that you're going to kill the target, and you could use the hit points more than the spell slot, you know, go ahead and, and, and use that. Really, there's not a lot else that separates uh, 
necromancers from other wizards at this point. In fact, I'd say that that this level two feature that you get is fairly weak compared to other to a lot of other schools, considering that you have to like make the killing blow using a spell slot to regain a little bit of hit points. Um, you know, right now we're pretty much just staying alive and being your typical blaster type, you know, spellcaster until we hit level five and especially six. Um, that's when it'll really start to feel like, you know, we are a commander of, of undead minions. Um, so for now, stay alive, blast things. Uh, level two paladin. Paladins get a fighting style at level two. I would recommend going with Interception, the Interception fighting style that's new uh, from Tasha's, Cauldron of Everything. You know, if things go according to plan, eventually we're going to be fighting with lots of minions around us, right? And they will be fairly squishy, uh, even with the buffs that we're going to be giving them. So every way that we can find to help keep them alive a little bit longer will be nice. And Interception's fantastic, I think. So with Interception, um, as a reaction, when, when an ally within five feet of you takes damage, you can, you know, impose your shield or uh, your weapon or something to absorb some of that damage. It's a d10 plus your proficiency bonus, um, which is really a pretty decent amount of hit points that you're intercepting, especially for a target that doesn't have a lot of hit points to begin with, right? Um, it can be a really nice way to help keep your, your undead alive, and I think better than the defensive fighting style, personally. Um, defensive fighting style, similar, you use your reaction to an ally that's nearby, but you impose disadvantage on the attack your undead thralls are not going to have a really high armor class um, and it's not going to increase and so even imposing disadvantage i think they're more often than not going to be getting hit um, especially as the game goes on and so just reducing the damage is probably going to you're probably going to get more mileage out of that than than imposing disadvantage i think also at level two paladins get divine smite that other quintessential um, paladin ability that everyone knows and loves so when you hit an enemy with a melee weapon attack, um, you can burn a spell slot, a first level spell slot to do 2d8 uh, additional damage. For every spell slot above first level, you can do an additional 1d8 of damage. And uh, Divine Smite is capped at uh, 5d8 additional damage, which would be a fourth level spell slot, right? We're actually probably going to get a bit of mileage out of Divine Smite, frankly, because we're probably not going to be using a ton of our spells otherwise, with, with one exception. Um, of course, you could always, you know, fill the, you know, the role of kind of a healer um, support type character here, um, especially right now. So maybe you will be using your spell slots for, you know, healing and buffing and things like that, at least, at least early on. Um, it may feel a little out of character for your evil paladin to be sort of like healing and stuff, but I don't know. You, you could still heal and be selfish, right? You're, you, you, you realize that, that these other party members are tools uh, for you to accomplish you know, your nefarious purposes, I don't know. And so you're going to keep them alive because they're going to help further your ends. Spells, speaking of. So... You know, to that end, sure, pick up Cure Wounds uh, to heal people, especially, you know, if they've gone down and you can bring them back up. Bless, of course, is one of the best buff spells in the game, as far as I'm concerned. Letting, uh, you know, the people that you cast it on get to add a D4 to their attacks and to their saving throws. All the usual su suspects are, are pretty good options here for spells. Again, for now, just like your, your Necromancer friend, you're pretty much just functioning as a fairly typical paladin. Um, maybe, and maybe, you're even sort of pulling the wool over, over your other party member's eyes, right? Uh, maybe they don't know you're an Oathbreaker or that you're planning on being an Oathbreaker. Um, maybe you're tricking them into trusting you. Maybe you're disguising your true motives. Um, if you're going to go this route, obviously, I would talk about this with your DM, maybe even the other players. Sometimes pulling a betrayal kind of tactic can really sour... Um, things for the other players at your table so you know just keep that in mind as you're planning your uh, nefariousness level three uh, at level three your wizard is going to um, get second level spells and honestly like knock yourself out dragon's breath is pretty good for sustained damage per round because you get to use it every single turn and potentially impact multiple enemies so 
if you can hit multiple enemies with it, I would say go for it. Otherwise, it's it's not great. If you're just using it on a single target, you're soon anyway. You're going to be better off with um, with cantrips. The other usual suspects are all fair game here. I would particularly highlight um, web and hold person. So uh, these these two offer really great control, right? Web um, gives an area of effect potential control where if enemies fail their save, um, they're going to be restrained and that's going to give people advantage on attacking them and it's going to cause them to have to use their turn in order to get out of your web and things like that. So that's great for control and frankly for damage for, the, for your entire party, right? Um, hold person is even stronger potentially, but it's only against one target, right? And they have to be humanoid. Um, but if, if they fail their save, they're going to be paralyzed, meaning that not only do all attacks against them have advantage, but if they hit, they're automatically critical hits. And uh, obviously that's huge and it's going to really be a big damage boost to your whole party, including your undead thralls that you will be getting shortly. At level three, your paladin, your oathbreaker, uh, gets uh, the divine health feature, which means that they're immune to disease. That's great. Um, and then they get their sacred oath, their subclass. So of course we're going Oathbreaker. Um, here's a question. Do you, do you have to choose another oath first in order to become an Oathbreaker? Um, it's a little unclear. I mean, it doesn't seem so rules as written. It doesn't necessarily specify that. I don't think, at least that's my interpretation. Um, again, discuss it with your DM, right? Uh, I'm sure if this is your plan to go Oathbreaker from the beginning, you know, your DM would probably be fine just letting you sort of be an Oathbreaker at level three. Um, but, you know, something to keep in mind and could be great for story purposes to maybe take a different oath and then break it, you know, shortly after or something like that because of something that happens, right? Um, you get Channel Divinity and uh, the Oathbreaker Paladin gets two, as all Paladins do, gets two options for their Channel Divinity use. Um, first off, Control Undead. Control Undead is um, pretty strong, right? So as an action, you can target one undead whose challenge rating is lower than your level, right? So at this point, it could only be a challenge rating two or less. Um, that's pretty strong still, but anyway, they make a wisdom saving throw, and if they fail it, they are under your command for 24 hours. Um, similar to the animate dead spell that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, before the time is up, you can use your channel divinity again, you know, before that 24 hours ends to just maintain control for another 24 hours. And that can be really strong because, it, you know, it, again, it scales as you level. So you could potentially control some pretty powerful undead minions with this. Problem, of course, is I have no idea what kind of undead you're going to be running into in your campaign you might not run into any other undead except for the ones that you yourselves you know summon and, and bring to the battle so um, anyway potentially really powerful if you ever do use this i would love to see the rest of your party's reaction right um if they sort of didn't know that you were an oath breaker or planning on on being an oath breaker um you know you're fighting a bunch of skeletons and then uh, suddenly one of them is your friend and he's following you around and <laughs> the rest of your party's like Care to explain yourself there, Mr. Self-Righteous? Again, like I say, don't know if you'll be able to use this and you know with what creatures you'll be able to uh, control, but if you get a good one, more power to you, it'll be awesome. The other channel divinity option that paladins get is Dreadful Aspect. Um, it's a very powerful fear, actually. So as an action, you choose creatures within 30 feet of you that you can see, they have to make a wisdom save, and, and the that's really nice, actually, that you get to pick and choose who is going to be afraid, right? They have to make a wisdom save or be feared for one minute, meaning they have, of course, disadvantage on attacks and ability checks while they can see you. Um, and they don't automatically get to save again against this fear on their next turn, like a lot of, you know, abilities that cause fear allow. Uh, only if they move 30 feet away from you. So they have to be 30 feet away from you and then they can make a save to try and uh, break that fear. So really strong debuff and even kind of a soft control option. Um, and it will do a lot to keep your party members and your undead minions alive. Hey guys, um, what happened? <laughs> Sorry, it's nighttime now. Um, Mr. Rogers is editing uh, 
the video right now and he just let me know that for some reason level four got cut off so I'm sure it was something that I did wrong but anyway um, here we go at level four um, your wizard necromancer gets their first ability score increase or feat and naturally you're gonna go with intelligence um, part of me is tempted to go with constitution here or maybe even like resilient con or um, you know or uh, warcaster or something but um, at the end of the day, you are a wizard, and you want your spells to not get resisted and do more damage and hit more often. So anyway, we're going to go with uh, with intelligence. As for the paladin, um, kind of the same thing, right? Uh, your first ability score increase or feat at level 4, and you want to take charisma. Now, the wizard doesn't actually benefit their undead horde all that much with an increased intelligence. Um, the Paladin, on the other hand, truly does. Um, not only in the temporary hit points, uh, the additional temporary hit points um, that, that uh, they will get from their inspiring leader, inspired leader feat, um, but there are other things that will come along as well that will increase the skeleton's damage, actually, and survivability based on uh, the Paladin's Charisma. So we're going to try and get that Charisma up as quickly as possible. Okay, back to the regular version of the show. At level 5, um, things start to get good for us. So uh, your wizard gets third level spells, and we're going to talk about Animate Dead, and we're going to talk about Counterspell. So Animate Dead first. This is your bread and butter. Um, and how it works is it doesn't require concentration. Um, you choose a pile of bones or a small or medium humanoid corpse. Um, if bones, you raise a skeleton. If corpse, you raise a zombie. And I'll add, I don't know why you couldn't raise a skeleton from a corpse, assuming that there are bones inside of it. Um, uh, you know, maybe your DM will make you burn the flesh away first before you actually get to use the bones. Um, ugh, this is going to get really macabre, isn't it? Macabre. Macabre. Macabre? Macabre. Um, macabre. Uh, anyway, which should you choose? Uh, skeletons or zombies? Um, in a nutshell, the skeletons can attack from range or melee. Uh, they come equipped with a short sword and a short bow, supposedly. And again, this is where our earlier questions about how they're equipped come into play. Uh, but for number crunching purposes, I'm just going to assume that the Abilities and statistics are exactly like they show up in the monster manual as per the spell description, right? Um, they do more damage than zombies skeletons do uh, They have a higher armor class, but fewer hit points um, zombies are melee only They uh, they do less damage. They have a lower armor class much lower, but they have more hit points um, They also have a chance to only drop to one hit point if they're dealt a killing blow a lot of people will argue that you should have a mix and, you know, once you get a few of them anyway and kind of have your zombies act as sort of a frontline disruptor for your skeletons that stand back and, and shoot uh, their bows at um, the enemies. It's not a terrible idea. I, I don't know that zombies are a lot tankier, beefier than skeletons because their AC is so low and they might not succeed on that, um, on that ability, whatever it's called floating text please um <laughs> that lets them survive sometimes if they take a killing blow right um but anyway we're going to assume that you're just taking all skeletons uh for now they're all attacking from range to sort of try and keep them spread out and less susceptible to area of effect uh, uh damage abilities and spells and things because we're trying to explore the limits of what's possible from a damage perspective um just remember like i say keep them spread out um, for now, you can only raise one undead using a third level spell. That will change shortly. Uh, and you get two more undead for every level you upcast the spell. Um, so a fourth level spell slot would give you three, right? It does not require concentration. Um, the undead remains under your control for 24 hours, similar to you know the paladin's um, channel divinity at which point you can recast the spell in order to maintain control. So hopefully you've had a long rest or else you could be in big trouble. 
um, and you've got those spell slots available, right? You uh, you can command um, any or all of your undead minions using a bonus action. Uh, you you issue them a command to do something, uh, and or you could even issue them a general command like attack what I attack or attack that thing or attack what my paladin ally attacks for that matter, and they should just continue doing that until you know you give them a bonus action telling them to do something else on a subsequent turn. So it shouldn't require you to use a bonus action every turn to command them, right? Um, so that's powerful. It's going to get crazy for us, and you'll see as we get into the numbers um, and higher levels. Want to talk about Counterspell. Counterspell, very important, right? Um, again, as we've discussed, one of the things that is really going to rain on your undead parade... <laughs> bunch of undead playing trombone marching down on Macy's Day Thanksgiving parade um, the thing that's gonna make your life miserable is uh, you know fireballs and other area of effect spells so having counter spell will be important for you right uh, to potentially stop that from happening and blowing all of your uh, hard-earned undead minions to smithereens um, the way Counterspell works, uh, when an enemy spellcaster goes to cast a spell, as a reaction, you can try to thwart it, stop it. Um, if, you know, if you're using a third level spell slot, then any spell being cast, third level or lower, will automatically be winked out and take no effect. Um, if the spell that's being cast by your enemy is, you know, higher than the spell slot that you are using for counter spell, then you have to make a check to see if you actually counter it, right? Um, the, the DC is 10 plus the enemy spell level, and you're using your spell casting ability on that check. Intelligence for us, obviously. Realistically, you should probably always save a spell slot or two for a counter spell. Um, for number crunching, of course, I'm assuming that we're throwing caution to the wind, and uh, we're going to use all of our spell slots for more minions. You probably shouldn't do that. But again, we're exploring the possible. So um, level five for your Paladin Oathbreaker, they get extra attack, fantastic, more damage, um, and second level spells. The only one that I'll mention is Aid. Um, aid, of course, lets you pick three allies, doesn't require concentration, lets you pick three allies, raise their max hit points by five, and, and give them five more hit points, right? Um, Keep in mind, this is different than temporary hit points, so they do stack, uh, and that's great. Now, most would argue that uh, that other players' characters are more powerful than undead thralls, than your little skeletons, right? They should therefore be the beneficiary of an aid spell. They'd probably be right. Um, and, you know, I mean, before long, you're not going to be able to, to cast this on every undead minion that your necromancer ally is summoning. When you upcast aid, it only increases the max hit points that get raised, not the number of creatures that are affected by it. Um, so, you know, why bother? I still like it. Um, these skeletons represent a big investment on your ally necromancer's part, and frankly on yours, it's kind of why you're here is to buff these things. Um, so, you know, five more hit points on a skeleton with only 13 hit points to begin with uh, is a big increase. Um, you may decide not to use it. That's fine. At level six, your necromancer gets undead thralls. And now we really start to feel like a necromancer. Um, when you cast animate dead, you get to raise one additional skeleton or zombie. Awesome. Um, especially for a level 3 spell, it doubles its effectiveness, right? Also, your undead thralls get extra hit points equal to your wizard level. And this is one of the reasons why we're not multi-classing, because we want to buff these things as much as we possibly can. Um, and they get to add your proficiency bonus to their weapon damage rolls. I wish it were attack rolls, because their plus to hit is not fabulous, and as monsters get harder and harder to hit, uh, they get less and less effective. But anyway, um, it's a nice bump. That plus to damage is great. So at this point, if we were to use all three of our third level spell slots as a necromancer to um, cast Animate Dead, we would have six skeletons, right? Um, assuming our paladin gives them a rousing speech <laughs> at the beginning of each day and you know at every rest, they would have 
13 hit points plus 10 for inspired leader plus six for your level for a total of 29 hit points each um, three of them might even have more if your paladin's using aid on them that's not bad right beefy little skeletons uh, okay so level six your paladin your oath breaker uh, gets aura of protection it's so good um, you and all of your allies within 10 feet of you get to add a bonus equal to your charisma modifier which is a plus four right now uh, to all of their saving throws your auras mr paladin are the main reason you're here don't forget that um, skeletons would have a plus six to their dexterity saving throws now um, so they've got a pretty decent chance at saving against that fireball and probably surviving two or maybe even three fireballs depending on the dice rolls here um, a third level fireball does 32 damage on average so if they made a save it'd be 16 right maybe three if, if it was a low if it was a low damage roll on that fireball um, okay level six damage report skeletons right now have a plus four to hit they'll always have a plus four to hit uh, d6 uh, plus two is typical plus three for your necromancer's proficiency bonus so plus five total and you have up to six of them um, we're looking for sustained damage numbers here so i'm simply assuming that your wizard is just casting you know toll the dead every turn for 2d12 damage assuming they're casting it on a target that's not at full health right um, and the paladin is just whacking stuff with a with a d8 weapon um, obviously you could go with a two-handed weapon here, but staying alive is much more important to your overall damage than an extra two damage from, you know, a greatsword would be. Um, so you're using a shield, you're staying alive. So against um, an enemy with a 10 armor class and a plus zero to their wisdom saving throw, all in with, you know, the wizard, the skeletons, and the necromancer, you're doing 62 damage per round on average and against an enemy with a 15 armor class and a plus five to their wisdom saving throw you're doing 42 damage per round um it's not bad you know compared to the other team up builds that i've done so far um it's not great check out the uh the link to the graphs and the math in the uh, in the video description um but yeah it's it's middle of the pack against low uh, ac enemies and bottom of the pack against high AC enemies. Um, now, if they are making attacks against enemies restrained by your web spell, for example, that your necromancer cast and thereby have advantage, obviously the numbers go way up. Um, if uh, they're making an attack against an enemy that you that your necromancer cast hold person on and it and it stuck and they're paralyzed, right? And well, now they have advantage and every hit's an automatic critical. Obviously, the damage goes up even more. Um, that's the great thing about being a wizard, right? So my advice would be for the necromancer to, again, use your concentration spell, spells for control, uh, you know, finding ways to help your horde be more effective in combat. Uh, and of course, obviously, if your dungeon master lets you equip your skeletons with better weapons, your damage is going to go up, etc. Um, granted, there's more to this undead army than just doing damage, right? Um, being a meat shield is fantastic and if you're saving your party members from getting hit uh, then then it is a skeleton well used right um, but anyway those are the numbers right at level seven um, your necromancer gets fourth level spell slots and that means for us if we upcast animate dead we're getting four more undead uh, with that spell slot and again, of course you may want to use your fourth level spell slot for any other number of things uh, But this is what we are going to be doing to try and push the limits of how powerful an undead army we can amass, right? Um, level seven your paladin gets aura of hate and this is the other main reason why we are here from now on you this paladin and any undead and fiends within 10 feet of you gain a bonus to melee weapon damage rolls equal to your charisma modifier plus four still for now um but wait you might ask i thought we were you know making these skeletons attack from range right wasn't that the point uh we were and still will be largely but um now you know i like to think of it as something has shifted sort of within the dynamic um between you between the necromancer the paladin and this undead horde they've They've come to view him or her 
more as a, uh, a platoon leader, right? They're they're wading into battle um, with with the Oathbreaker, and uh, and you know the Necromancer is really sort of acting as the general, directing them, or may and or the arms supplier. <laughs> Anyway, they're going into battle with the Oathbreaker, you know, standing shoulder to shoulder, um, hacking it at the same enemy with their short swords uh, instead of shooting it with their bows. Or at least, um, I mean, assuming a medium-sized creature, you could potentially surround it, right, with the Oathbreaker plus seven other skeletons, right, could surround a single medium or small-sized creature. Um, they would get to benefit from, from both of its auras, the Aura of Protection and uh, this new Aura of Hate, and just do a lot more damage. Um, these are your special forces, Skellies, your, your, your Green Berets, your Death Squad, right? And maybe three of them end up getting a Bless spell from the, from the Paladin, or I mean, sorry, an Aid spell from the Paladin. Uh, or, I suppose, Bless, right? Could, could, could also work here, but we're going to have use for a concentration here in a minute. Um, and, you know, if one of those uh, melee Skellies goes down, maybe one of the ones that are hanging in the back shooting bows pulls out their short sword and steps into the fray, right? Um, yes, in melee range, your minions are more likely to get killed, but that's, again, that's kind of a good thing. It's, it's, not, it's not terrible for them to take a hit that otherwise would be directed at you or one of your party members, right? Um, and at this point, your skeletons have, a th have 31 hit points, uh, including the temporary hit points that you give them, with a plus six to their deck save, uh, you know, um, and, and, and those things will keep going up. So I'm a little less nervous about them getting wiped out. Um, it's still very possible, again, of course, with you know with a cleric or with an area of effect, powerful area of effect spell. Um, but you know this all goes back to the, everything that we talked about at the beginning in the preamble. So um, level eight, your necromancer gets uh, another ability score increase or feat. Um, I'm going to recommend that you bump intelligence again, and so now we're capped at 20 intelligence, which is great for all of our spells and DCs and things. Um, and you also get another fourth level spell slot for four more skeletons. So now you've got 14 skeletons total. And that's nothing compared to where we're going. Um, level 8 Paladin uh, gets an ability score increase our feet as well, of course. And again, I'd recommend that you bump Charisma. So we're capping that at 20. Remember, your Charisma bumps the temporary hit points that, they're, that, that everybody's going to receive, um, the melee damage that they do, and their plus to their saving throws. So really important for your paladin to get high charisma ASAP. At level nine, your necromancer gets fifth level spells. And if we were to use that for animate dead, that's six more skeletons. Of course, you might want to be using animate objects or wall of force or lots of other amazing spells. And if you want to do that, you should. Um, so we have 20, 20 skeletons total now. Uh, paladins at ninth level get uh, third level spells. And um, we're going to talk about two, Aura of Vitality and Crusader's Mantle. So uh, Oathbreakers actually get Animate Dead here, but they don't, when they cast it, it doesn't benefit from all of the things that the Necromancers Animated Dead uh, benefit from. So I'm not going to worry about it. We won't get as many from them anyway either. Um, we have much more important uses for our third level spells. Aura of Vitality is probably my favorite healing spell in the game because I just love all things sustainable, right? Um, you cast it, requires your concentration, and then as a bonus action, um, every turn, as long as you maintain concentration, you can uh, heal a creature within 30 feet of you for 2d6 uh, of healing. It's not a ton, but you, you know your skeletons don't have a ton, and they could probably benefit from this because it does not restrict you from using it on undead so you can heal your minions here. Um, if you're more concerned about keeping your, uh, you know, your horde alive and having them sort of be a meat shield for you and things, um, you might want to consider using this. Of course, we are exploring the limits of what's possible damage-wise, so um, I'm going to talk about Crusader's Mantle and assume that we're using it here. Uh, it's so perfect for us because unlike um, most buffs in the game, it has no cap on the number of creatures that it can affect. As long as a non-hostile creature is within 30 feet of you, they do an extra d4 of radiant damage when they hit with a weapon attack. And I love the idea, by the way, of an undead skeleton doing radiant damage um, on, on an attack. That's great. 
Shouldn't they be doing necrotic? No. They're now wholly evil undead things. Um, of course, a d4 isn't a ton of extra damage, but uh, multiplied by 20 skeletons? It is, right? So, level 9 damage report. <clears throat> All right, our skeletons with temporary hit points included now have 36 hit points, not bad. Um, they have a plus seven to their deck saves, pretty good, right? Uh, you'll have seven of them, I'm assuming, in melee range with your Oathbreaker surrounding a single small or medium-sized creature. And those melee skeletons would be doing 1d6 plus 1d4 plus 11 damage now on each hit. Um, and the other ones that are that are in range, 13 other ones in range shooting bows are still doing 1d6 plus 1d4 plus 6 damage per attack. Um, so, against a target with a 10 armor class and a plus 0 to their wisdom save, you would do on average 250 damage per round in this situation. And against a target with a 16 armor class, uh, and a plus six to their wisdom save, it would be 155 damage per round on average. Throw computer out the window. I mean, <laughs> this is, you know, and this is of course much higher against a restrained or paralyzed target, you know, that's subjected to a wizard control spell. So just in three levels, this, this duo, this necromancer, oathbreaker, duo you know went from the bottom of the pack um to, compared to other team up builds that i've done to head and shoulders above any other you know two two character combo that we've done so far and uh, it's gonna get so much worse from here on out i'm gonna try and move a little more quickly um we've pretty much got the gist of what we're doing the core of the builds for both of these characters is pretty much complete and uh and we're just kind of on a crazy train right now and we're gonna ride it to the end and see where it takes us. So at level 10, your Necromancer um, gets another fifth level spell slot. Um, that's six more skeletons for us, assuming animate dead, so 26 skeletons total. Um, and they get a feature called Inured to Undeath, um, which lets you become resistant to necrotic damage and your hit point maximum can't be reduced. Uh, level 10 Paladin, Oathbreaker, gets uh, the Aura of Courage, which is nice. You and all friendlies within 10 feet of you um, can't be frightened any longer. That's fantastic. At level 11, the for your Necromancer, um, you're told the dead goes to 3d12 now, for what it's worth. Um, and you get level 6 spells. That's 8 more skeletons for a total of 34. Now, you also have access at this point as a 6th level spell to create undead. Um, and... I want to talk about it for a second because I think most people who would talk about necromancers would recommend this spell. It lets you summon three ghouls instead of eight skeletons, right? Uh, ghouls are pretty powerful. Um, you, they, it functions the same way. You have control of them for 24 hours. You can recast it to maintain control, etc. Um, so, okay, ghouls are great. They have nine more hit points. Um, it's one less AC, so it's not actually a ton tankier, um, depending on what's attacking you. But anyway, um, they also have this great feature where if they hit something, uh, other than an elf for some reason, which I like, uh, or another undead, they can paralyze, potentially, the creature. Paralyze, right? That's so, so strong. And so I think this is why people say, yeah, ghouls, they're awesome. Um, the problem here, well, okay, a couple of problems. The save to avoid being paralyzed is a constant, or sorry, constitution save. Um, and that's usually pretty high for a lot of monsters, especially, you know, by level 11. Uh, and the DC to resist it is only a 10. They only have to get a 10 or better. Um, you only get three of them instead of eight skeletons. So just straight up damage wise, the numbers are a lot worse. Now, if you could rely upon paralyze hitting, um, it would probably be worth it, right? It would. It would be worth it. But I just don't know what you're going to be fighting. Um, I, I mean, I don't know I don't know how high the enemy's resistance is going to be, what their constitution save is going to be like. Um, but with a plus four to hit on these on these ghouls and only a DC 10 for the save, it just it doesn't feel like a great trade to me. 
and maybe I'm wrong. You get three chances at it, right, with three ghouls, so I don't know, maybe. Or maybe if you make sure you cast Bless on these ghouls and or you know, take a spell from your wizard to lower, you know, the saving throws, you know, or multi-class in order to get get it there, things like that. I mean, there's ways that you could kind of work around this and, and sort of make it work a little better, but that's that's just not what we've been doing, frankly. Um, maybe we could get there, and I'm sure people will comment and say, oh, if you, you know, did this and did that, then it would be fantastic. And, and sure, you know, if you wanted to do something like that, great. In fact, it might make more sense because the number of skeletons that we're getting is fairly untenable and we're just, again, we're on the crazy train and we're riding it to the end. Um, but anyway, we're going to assume skeletons here because <clears throat> eight skeletons is a lot and with all the buffs that we're giving them, it's, it's just, you know, action economy, numbers, it just ends up being more damage. Um, so, level 11 paladin. They get improved divine smite. Um, that's an extra d8 of damage, of radiant damage, uh, when you hit with a melee weapon, so that's great for our paladin's damage. At level 12, um, your necromancer gets another ability score increase or feat. I would say, you know, bump your constitution, or maybe take the resilient constitution or warcaster feat. We haven't done that yet. Um, just, you know, helping our survival, helping our concentration saves. Um, level 12, paladin, of course, also gets an ability score increase or feat. And I'm going to recommend bumping the strength. Um, get it to 18. So now our weapon attacks are going to land more frequently, hit harder. Um, you know, maybe you'll want to go constitution again in the interest of staying alive and things. Um, so little of our damage is coming from our actual Oathbreaker and Necromancer at this point, right? Uh, that maybe we should just focus on survivability. But whatever, we'll put it into strength here when, for, for number crunching purposes. It won't make a huge difference one way or the other. Level 13, your Necromancer uh, gets level seven spells. That's 10 more skeletons for a total of 44 skeletons. <laughs> 42 skeletons, 43 skeletons, 44 skeletons, ha, ha, ha. Um, if you actually use a 7th level spell slot for Animate Dead, I and your DM will be so disappointed in you. Uh, level 13 Paladin, Oathbreaker. Uh, you get um, Aura of Purity. And this is just a once in a while kind of thing, but it would give your army uh, advantage on saves against being blind, charmed, deafened, paralyzed, poisoned, and stunned. Um, so super useful in those kind of niche situations, right? Again, they're, they they got to be within 10 feet of you here. Level 13 damage report, right? So 44 skeletons, seven of them in melee doing 1d6 plus 1d4 plus 12 damage. 37 of them in range doing 1d6 plus 1d4 plus 7 damage. Um, they have 44 hit points each, and those within 10 feet of you anyway have a plus 7 to their dexterity saving throw. So, against an enemy with a 10 armor class and a plus zero to their wisdom save, you are doing, on average, 505 damage per round. And against an enemy with a 17 armor class and a plus seven to their wisdom saving throw, you're still doing 280 damage per round. And it just is gonna keep getting worse. So, let's keep going. At level 14, your necromancer. Um, gets the Command Undead feature. Um, as an action, you choose one undead you can see. It has to make a charisma save uh, or be controlled by you. It's, it's kind of similar to the Paladin Channel Divinity ability here, um, except that there's no challenge rating cap listed, and you don't have to do it every 24 hours. You just have them under your control until they die or you die or you use this feature again on something else. Um, if it has an intelligence of eight or more, it has advantage on its saving throw. If it, has, if it has an intelligence of 12 or more, it can make that saving throw every hour until it breaks free. Um, so, you know, I hope you run into like a Nightwalker or a Storm Giant Skeleton, right? That have low saving throws here and, and, and under eight intelligence. Um, I really do but I have no way of knowing what you're gonna face in your game. So it could be amazing or it could be worthless uh, or anything in between, but it's really pretty cool. And when you get to use it on a powerful undead creature, it will feel really awesome um, in a way to bolster your, uh, your, your army of undead. Uh, Paladins at level 14, uh, you get Cleansing Touch. 
As an action, you can end one spell on yourself or a willing creature. Period. No save, no roll, no nothing. Uh, so pretty dang strong against those really powerful enemy spellcasters. Um, you can do it charisma modifier times per day, so five times you know, per long rest. At level 15, your necromancer gets eight level spells, and that means 12 more skeletons for this, uh, this little trip down insanity lane that we're on. Uh, let's talk about Create Undead again really quickly, because if you cast Create Undead as an eighth level spell, um, you could now instead do five ghouls, two ghasts, or two whites. Um, ghasts are basically more powerful versions of ghouls, but with the added bonus of potentially poisoning anything within five feet of them. Um, skeletons are immune to poison, so just keep them away from you and your other allies and you should be fine. Um, again, I'd still probably not use them over 12 more skeletons if we're, if we're being ridiculous and just kind of looking at numbers, right? Um, whites look really cool. They can potentially life drain and even raise a zombie from an enemy if they get the killing blow on it, and it's a humanoid. Um, they're tankier than skeletons, they do more damage, but again, two of them pale in comparison to 12 skeletons uh, if, you know, if we were to upcast Animate Dead when we're living in the fantasy land of dozens of skeletons under your control. Um, just stay with me here. So level 15 paladin, um, you get supernatural resistance, you have resistance to non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, uh, or slashing damage, and you know, for those who have watched videos in the past or, or know this already anyway, a lot of you, uh, most of the damage that, that enemies are going to deal in game comes in the form of non-magical bludgeoning, slashing, or piercing damage. So that's actually really pretty good. Um, won't work against everything, of course, but it will give you resistance to a lot of things, so that'll really improve your, your survivability. A level 16 wizard gets their final ability score increase or feat, at least that we'll mention. Um, so again, I'd take plus constitution or maybe warcaster or resilient con if you haven't yet. Um, might as well try to increase our survivability and our constitution and concentration saves. Um, level 16 paladin gets uh, their ability score increase or feat. I would say take strength, cap it at 20. Um, might as well continue to increase our damage. And finally, for our purposes, a level 17 wizard. Um, your Toll the Dead goes up to 4d12. Um, you get ninth level spells, so that's 14 more skeletons for 70 total skeletons. Um, don't ask me where you're getting all of those piles of bones outside of a graveyard. <laughs> uh, create Undead, again, would, as a ninth level spell, give us two mummies which are even tankier than whites. They do more damage. They can even potentially fear or petrify. Um, again, thanks to action economy, not to mention how low the, the DC of the mummy's cool abilities is, um, the numbers just look a lot better with skeletons, unless you're fighting something with a super low, you know, uh, constitution saving throw. Um, level 17 paladin. You get fifth level spells. Um, I'll just mention one, Circle of Power. So it's another great defensive aura spell. Uh, it requires your concentration. Friendly, friendly creatures within 30 feet have advantage on saves against spells and spell effects. Um, and if succeeding on a saving throw would cause the, the creature to take half damage, then if they're within this aura, they take no damage instead. So fireballs are a lot less scary now, um, but you know a high-level AOE spell will still potentially be devastating to your horde, um, and of course a level five cleric or above will also be devastating to your horde. So, anyway, final damage report. Uh, right, seventy skeletons, seven seven of them uh, in melee doing one d six plus one d four plus thirteen damage per attack, sixty three of them. Uh, attacking from range, doing 1d6 plus 1d4 plus 8. Um, they have 52 hit points each, and those within 10 feet of you, anyway, have a plus 7 to their dex, staves, dex save still, plus, you know, other aura benefits like immunity to fear and things. Um, final damage report, like I say, against an enemy with a 10 armor class and a plus 0 to their wisdom save, on average, this uh, monstrosity would do 848 damage per round, 
and against an enemy with an 18 armor class and a plus 8 to their wisdom save, it would be 421 damage per round on average still. All right, final thoughts. Um, obviously, this is ridiculous. <laughs> and I know that. Um, and I know, like, I can't imagine anyone ever doing this, right, in any D&D campaign. Again, maybe a one-shot uh, where it all takes place outside and, and it's just for fun and just to kind of do something weird and crazy and silly and kind of see what happens. Um, but but outside of that, you know, the question is, how do you, like, what do you do with this? How do you balance this? What's the happy medium, right? Um, maybe your DM agrees to not overdo it with the AoE and the destroy undead, um, and you agree not to go over, I mean, I don't know, what's a reasonable number, 10 skeletons? Um, I mean, even that's kind of a lot, but... But but then again, you're a necromancer. Like this is what you want to do. This is why you're here. And 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 it just seems like, if you try to really take advantage of the thing that you're supposed to be doing, it's just, it's untenable, right? Um, I I do like having I, I do like the idea of having um, like an elite squad of sort of melee undead around the Oathbreaker Paladin. Um, you know, maybe you're maybe maybe you and your DM agree to not summon more than seven at a time, so they can all sort of benefit and be this kind of elite uh, undead squad. But but you can equip them with magic items, with with uh, or at least with magic weapons and armor. Um, or maybe they scale better with you as you level. Um, but you can't summon as many of them, right? So uh, you, these undead get additional hit point bonuses, um, bonuses to their armor class, bonuses to their plus to hit. Um, and maybe their attacks can be considered magical at some point, but, um, you know, and maybe this is based on your intelligence modifier, your proficiency bonus, but you can't get more than like three or four or five of them or something like that. Another idea, maybe you can't, maybe you can't upcast animate dead past, I don't know, uh, fifth level, a fifth level spell or even fourth, um, the, the nice thing about that is that it would sort of really motivate you and give you good reason for using Create Undead so that not only do you, you know, you don't just have five billion skeletons, but you've got some skeletons and ghouls and ghasts and whites and mummies and you're kind of controlling this big horde. That's cool. It's also, even then, might be too much, right? Too many minions. I don't know. I mean, I, for seventh and eighth and ninth level spells, it's not particularly amazingly powerful. Um, it's just that, that you still have all of these challenges with having all of these minions and hordes kind of at your disposal slowing down combat clogging up the lanes in in small rooms and you know all those kinds of things that, that we talked about at the beginning so i don't know there are there are challenges again maybe maybe animate dead maybe you can only have one casting of animate dead active at a time right and so you can't use all of your third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth level spell slots to cast the same spell. Maybe you just have to pick one spell slot, cast it, and now you, you don't get to cast Animate Dead again until you're ready to reassume control. Or, you know, if you cast it again, the ones you had control over before are no longer under your control. I don't know. Something like that. Um, seems like it might help to kind of make this work. I would love to hear your guys' thoughts on how you might kind of try to run this at your table or as a character to sort of make it work logistically and from a balance perspective. Um, one, one final thing I guess I would say, it might be fun to run this as just like a two-person campaign that was designed for um, like a full party, right? Um, but your DM isn't pulling any punches. I mean, maybe they can't have clerics that, that can destroy undead, but otherwise, sort of the gloves are off and kind of see how it goes. You might get decimated um, if there's lots of fireballs coming your way. But but otherwise, you know, if there weren't a ton, um, it, it could be fun. It could be a challenge, at least early on, and then eventually it'd probably get to a point where it's not really challenging anymore. <laughs> But uh, there, there is also a potential to, to play this as a single class, right? You'd go six levels into Wizard and then seven levels into Oathbreaker Paladin. It would be incredibly mad, multiple ability score dependent, and it wouldn't work all that well until you hit like level 13. But at that level, it would be pretty powerful. So again, maybe for a higher level one-shot or a campaign that starts kind of in the mid-range, 
um, it could be it could be fun to do. But anyway, that's the episode for the week. Um, I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts and critiques and criticism. I'm sure you've got plenty, so you know, let me have it. Um, let me know what you think. And again, if you uh, if you enjoy the content, I hope you will like and subscribe, and comment and do all of the things. Um, hope you enjoyed the show. I had a lot of fun uh, going down this crazy train. And uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing you know what you guys might do to balance it. So until then, thanks for watching. Love you guys, and I hope to see you soon.